ready? All right. All right, good morning. Good morning. Let's go ahead and open with prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for giving us yet another day together as your people and to worship you. We pray that you would sanctify our spirits by your word, that you would guide us into truth, and that you would help us to be better equipped to live for you throughout the week. In Christ, my prayer, amen. So this class, uh, we've, we've so far discussed, uh, after we've dealt with all of the foundational issues for several weeks, we have discussed the win of worship. So we talked about the Sabbath. We talked about the music, which is related to the how of worship. That was, I moved that forward. I was going to delay it until later, but I moved that forward because I knew that everybody was sort of eager to, to kind of get there and to discuss the question about music and instruments and so on. Now we're going to look at the wear of worship uh, as well as uh, clothing, uh, vestments this morning. So first, the wear of worship. Our confession says this in chapter 21, section 6. Neither prayer nor any other part of religious worship is now under the gospel either tied unto or made more acceptable by any place in which it is performed or towards which it is directed. But God is to be worshipped everywhere, in spirit and in truth, as in private families daily, and in secret each one by himself, so more solemnly in the public assemblies, which are not carelessly or willfully to be neglected or forsaken, when God by his word or providence calleth thereunto. So, this, of course, is a reflection of what we've already discussed when we were dealing with the regulative principle and we looked at John chapter 4, and Christ clearly indicates that God is not to be worshipped uh, in the New Covenant era, either exclusively in Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. The worship of God in the New Covenant is not tied to any particular place. That, of course, is related to everything we've discussed so far pertaining to temple worship. So... Jerusalem was the place where God set his name. And even in that conversation with the Samaritan woman, Christ is very clear, salvation is of the Jews. So you have God placing his name at Jerusalem. He is worshipped in the temple, but that was always provisional. It was always provisional. It was merely for a time as a type and a symbol leading God's people and his church into greater maturity in the New Covenant era when we are, again, no longer tied to a particular place. So we cannot say that a particular location is more sacred than any other location for the worship of God. We cannot say, because we, again, based on our regulative principle, we do not have authorization from Scripture to say that this kind of building is sacred and this kind of building is not. And so you have to have this kind of architecture when you gather for worship. We are not permitted to do that. Having said that, we have already said in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, you'll recall uh, that we are told that there are some uh, issues that are related, just common to human actions and societies, uh, which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence according to the general rules of the word. So there are some things that Scripture doesn't command and they are things that we have to do just by, as a function of meeting together. So we previously we gave the example of, uh, for example, time. Well, God tells us we have to worship on the Christian Sabbath, but he doesn't tell us at specifically what time we need to gather. So we have to uh, decide, the session has to decide, well, we're going to have service at this time on Sunday. Well, one of those features that we have to make a decision about is the where of worship. We have to decide to worship in some building because we're spatial creatures. Uh, we're, we're bound in three dimensions, and so we have to find somewhere to worship. And given that the location needs to be determined by, uh, as, as it says, the light of nature and Christian prudence, that provides some guidance as to generally what kinds of places uh, we're going to, the, the way the architecture is going to work, the way the location is going to work, and so on. So as far as location, obviously, we choose a place that is most convenient for the congregation, and usually that works the other way around. So if you have a congregation that meets in a particular place, then people who are interested in finding a church in that area are going to go to that church. Um, but it, it amounts to the same thing. We, we meet in the location that is a convenient, a sufficiently convenient drive for everybody. 
Now, as far as the architecture is concerned, again, we don't have a specific, specific guidelines as to exactly what architecture is supposed to look like, but there is a theological significance to this. Early on in the history of the Christian church, the, particularly by the fourth century, so early on, as you, as you all are well aware, you read in your New Testament, and this, this uh, continued for some time, you had Christians gathering in houses, right? So they would gather in private residences for worship. Largely beginning in the fourth century, right, when Constantine comes to power and Constantine uh, first permits Christianity, and of course later on in, in the Roman Empire, Christianity will become the official religion, but he grants religious toleration to Christianity, and you start to see Christian churches pop up, church buildings pop up, and these church buildings were actually, they're called basilica, okay? And so you have a Christian basilica. Does anybody know what a basilica is? Or what it's named for? Okay. So basilica, it's related to the adjective basilicon. Uh, it has to do with royal or kingly. The basilica uh, for Rome were actually government buildings. And these government buildings were where you would have uh, decide judicial issues and you would go before the magistrate there. And so it was called uh, a basilica. Christians just took over that model for their churches. They just turned the same style of architecture for those government buildings into churches. And this lasts largely or influences the, the way churches are structured all the way up. You see this in the medieval period and beyond. And so, just to look at the structure, this has, again, theological significance, you'll see. Um, so normally, you have the narthex or the atrium, so you have this introductory point. You have this, is called the nave, and usually the nave uh, has one or more aisles on either side. Sometimes, on each side, you would have little chambers that are prayer chambers, okay? So you come up the nave, and then you have this, which is called the transept. And then you have this area back here is called the apse. And then this is where the altar would be. Uh, for those of you who have been in these style churches before, has anybody been in a church style like this? You've seen those? Okay. So you're, a fami you're familiar with what they look like on the inside, and you can see it kind of has the design of a cross. Now, of course... Just to show you an image of the interior of one of these, uh, of course, this is uh, from the chapter on particularly Gothic architecture, but it's the same kind of... Anybody see that? Um, give you maybe one other example. If you've seen these before, see that? So the design of these churches, if... You enter in from the atrium. Uh, you're, to what is your attention drawn? What is the focus? The altar, right? So you're particularly focused. The eye line is down the nave to the altar. And so when processions would come in, of course, again, if you've ever seen this in a Roman Catholic church, uh, or if you've seen it in an Anglican church, uh, you will recognize there will be processions fairly ornate processions entering in from the back and moving toward the altar. And it's supposed to be awe-inspiring, and in many ways it is. Um, it's something, even just the architecture itself, as you saw from those images, there's something that appears transcendent about it, something beautiful about it. But the idea of the design was it draws the eye line down to the altar. So the central focus is the altar, while the lectern and the pulpit will be on either side, they're not central. What theological message does that send? So if, the, if, the, if your eye line is drawn to the altar, if this is the central focus of the architecture, what does that say about worship? Well, it's certainly true that, that they, they would want to say that God is the focus, but specifically what? Sacrifice, right. So the altar is the central act of worship in the Roman Catholic community. And of course, uh, uh, this is arguably taken over to some extent in, in, in Anglican uh, worship as well. And so you have the focus 
is on the altar and therefore the focus is on sacrifice. And as you can imagine, all of these things go together. We've previously discussed where you have a priest, there you have sacrifice. And if you have sacrifice, there you have an altar. Right? So all of those elements go together. Now, once we get to Protestant worship, Protestant worship changes this. So particularly beginning in the 16th century, you see renovations to the way churches are, uh, are organized. And what becomes central? The word becomes central. And how is that reflected in the architecture, the organization, the, the structure of the church? The pulpit, right? So the pulpit becomes central. And very often, of course, you'll see uh, elevated pulpits. And so the idea is instead of the eye being drawn toward the altar and saying we are here to celebrate a sacrifice, the sacrifice of the mass, instead you have the word is central and the, sacrament, the sacraments are bound to the preached word. Okay. So you can see this, and we've attempted to do, to do that in, in our church as well. So when you look at the, the sanctuary and you look down the line of, of what would be the equivalent of the nave or the aisles, you're drawn to, there's a raised platform, and central on that platform is where the pulpit is, where the word is uh, read and preached. And then you have below it the table for the celebration of Lord's Supper, and then back behind it you'll see uh, the baptismal font. So the idea is, again, to prioritize. There's a theological, we're not saying that, that you have to organize your church this way, but there is a theological rationale for doing so. It's reasonable to have the word prioritized and therefore to have the pulpit prioritized and everything sort of oriented around it and to not draw our attention to anything else. Now, another feature of Protestant architecture, uh, you may recall we've, briefly mentioned it here before, Baroque art. Uh, one of the purposes, at least one of the theological purposes of Baroque art was, does anybody know? The Counter-Reformation yes. art, yeah, was to undo the Reformation itself. That's right. To oppose the Protestants. So, Baro so Baroque architecture was in part designed as part of the Counter-Reformation because the Roman Catholic Church wanted to engage the senses of the people because they believed it would be an appeal back to the Roman Catholic Church. So why do you need to do all of that spiritual Protestant stuff where, again, the word is prioritized and central when you could have beautiful paintings and you could have beautiful church architecture that, again, engages the senses? The same thing with music. It engages all of the senses. And so they would say, there's something more transcendent, more beautiful about this. Come back to Rome. And so they're trying to draw people back into the Roman Catholic Church in that way. Protestant architecture and art, for the most part, even before the Counter-Reformation, and hence why the Counter-Reformation looks the way that it does, the Protestant Church has generally rejected this tendency. Again, worship is not, there's not something more spiritual because your building looks a certain way. There's not something more spiritual because you have a certain kind uh, of artwork in the building. It's not saying that artwork is bad. It's not saying beautiful architecture is bad. It's just saying those are temporal goods. They don't convey any spiritual benefit. They're just temporal goods and, and ones for which we give thanks and we ought to praise God for it, but it doesn't have, it's not itself an element of worship. It does not itself convey grace. And so Protestants wanted to carefully guard against any sense, uh, any superstition that would suggest that that kind of architecture, that kind of art would convey grace to the viewer or to the hearer. I have a question. Yes. Um, now, in this Baroque period, is that when candles came in, the lighting of the candles in the Catholic Church, or was that... That was, that was prior to... So that had existed since, since the medieval period. Okay. Um, and so that was antedated this. So, so you, the way you can think about it is Baroque art and architecture was in some respects carrying on consistently the same principles that had already been there. But what they were doing is they were sort of turning it up to 11 and they were emphasizing 
their distinctiveness over against the Protestant claims to be focused on spirituality and the preaching of the word. And so they said, we're going to distance ourselves from Protestants. We're going to say we're something different and something better. Come back to Rome because we have all the things that engage all your senses and that seems more transcendent. Right? Um, yes? You mentioned a minute ago the elevated pulpit. Yes. What's the rationale behind that? Yes. So again, the focus is on the word. Right? We have the, 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 central, the pulpit in the center. And we have it elevated to indicate that the focus is on the word and the word has authority over the entire congregation, right? It's elevating, the, the pulpit is elevating itself the word, which is to say it's, a, it's a, almost symbolic for elevating the word of God over the people. Yeah, I thought it was more so short people. <laughs> <laughs> that too, that too. Um, so yeah, so there's a, there's a theological reason for it. Is that, is that sufficient? Is that what you're looking for? Okay. Yeah. High and lift it up. In my denomination, I don't know of two churches that have elevated pulpits now. Hmm. One's Greensboro. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I know also uh, First ARP, uh, they have an elevated stage for that. And so some of, them, some of them do. Yes? When you say elevated, are you talking about up on the stage yes. like ours or elevated even? No, I'm saying, uh, I, well, I'm just suggesting at this point, the fact that it is on a stage relative to the congregation does indicate that it has, it's symbolic of the, the, the authority that it has. It's not on ground level, right, uh, where everyone else is. Now, it is true that in the Reformation, you will see, uh, and you no doubt have seen these, you'll see pulpits that are really ornate, and they'll have a staircase going way up, and it's like overhanging the congregation so that the preacher is literally looking down on the people, right? And so it's symbolic, again, of effectively the word of God is the voice of God, the voice of God coming from the heavens to talk to the people, right? It's authoritative over that congregation. So uh, in our case, it's sufficiently, I think it's on a stage, it's above the congregation, it still conveys this same idea. Um, and you'll notice, again, not only is the altar not central, um, we don't have an altar, right? So you don't want to uh, confuse, and, and we'll come back to this when we talk about the sacraments in future weeks, but we don't want to confuse uh, our view of the sacraments with the Roman view of the sacraments. The Lord's Supper is not a sacrifice, and so we don't have an altar. Instead, we have a table. Uh, you will see claims during the Reformation when they were talking about the celebration of the Lord's Supper that what you wanted was... Uh, they would sometimes use some variation of the phrase simplex munditiis. You want something that's a simple table. It's not so ornate that it becomes a distraction away from the supper itself and the act of the supper. So it's a simple table. It is the munditiis. It's elegant, right? It is neat. It's, um, it's, 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 it has its own beauty, right? But it's not, it's not ornate. It's just simple and elegant. And you would have that table there. And they would actually have, in, in, uh, very often in, in Reformation churches, both on the continent and, and uh, in, in Britain, you would find they would have literally a table. And so when the congregation would come forward for the table for, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, they would literally come forward and sit down at the table. Okay? Because it's a meal. <laughs> and so you're coming there, and you're, it's not an altar, right? And so you come forward, and you sit down at the table. And they would actually have, uh, I remember this is uh, John Alasco's description of, of what their church would do. Um, obviously, if you have more people in the church that can fit at the table, not everybody can come and sit at the table at the same time. So they would actually rotate out. You would have the first group of people come and they would sit down at the table. They would partake of the, of the supper together. They would leave the table and go and sit down. And then the next group would come and they would partake of the supper together. And that's just practically the only way that they could see doing it. Now, we achieve effectively the same thing. We just have everybody serve and then you all sit down and then we partake of the, the supper together. Uh, but they did want to emphasize that, again, this is not an altar. It is a table. And you'll notice that the table is, as I mentioned before, down below the pulpit because uh, we, don't want, we don't want to separate word and sacrament or see the sacrament as something that is completely distinct from word and alongside it. The sacrament, and, and in this case particularly Lord's Supper, uh, 
is tied to the word. So the word is still standing over that sacrament. It's defining the nature of that sacrament. The efficacy is connected to the preached word and to believing that preached word. The elements themselves in isolation uh, do not carry that, that kind of efficacy. So going back to, we mentioned, uh, so Baroque architecture was designed to engage and Baroque art was designed to engage all of the senses to bring people back to Rome. Now, the Protestant reaction to that uh, is not uniform. And so you'll see very uh, a, a return to what some might see as an excessive simplicity. So there was a concern among some Protestants that we don't want to, again, be superstitious. We don't want to be caught up in, in what is just sensory. So we're going to move away from that and have strip everything down and make it completely bare. And that, again, is not wrong uh, because we don't have a specific command that you have to have this kind of artwork or this kind of architecture. And so uh, there was an attempt to try to uh, make it as simple as possible. Uh, the danger, I think, and particularly the danger in, in our time, is churches that end up stripping away any distinctiveness to a church building so much that what it functionally does is it just looks like any other kind of business. It looks like any other kind. It looks like a mall or something, right? Uh, and again, not wrong to worship in those places, but if you're actively going out of your way to try to build a church that looks like a business, that looks like a mall or that looks like some sort of entertainment center, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a distraction. And so again, that goes back to let's do what we're doing according to the light of nature and Christian prudence, according to the general rules of the word. So uh, let's, let's be self-conscious about what we're doing when we're building ch churches and, and, and designing churches. One of the best expressions, I think, of church architecture occurred in the 18th into the 19th centuries, and you had uh, the neoclassical style, and particularly in the 19th century, you had lots of Greek revival churches. And what this did was, it wasn't, they were trying on, on the one hand, they didn't want ugly churches. They wanted to avoid intentionally making their churches ugly because there's no reason to do that. You don't want to intentionally make your church ugly. On the other hand, they did not want to go the Baroque direction of trying to make the architecture of the art convey something spiritual to act as though that itself conveys grace or that itself is, is sort of transcendent. And so the, the, the best description of Protestant art and architecture, I think, is elegant simplicity. That's what they were aiming for, elegant simplicity. It's not overdone, it's not excessively ornate, uh, but it is elegant. It's not intentionally ugly either. And so when you look at neoclassical or Greek revival churches, that's precisely what they were designed to do. They don't have this Baroque ornate arch uh, artwork. They don't have uh, this uh, ornate architecture. It's very simple, uh, but it was designed to convey both modesty and restraint. That's what it's designed to do. It's designed to say this is a place where we are focused on spiritual things and we have order, modesty, and restraint. So you can see an example of this. This is a Presbyterian church in Virginia uh, that was built in the 1840s. It's still today a conservative Presbyterian church, uh, which is surprising. That's not always the case. But this is Tab Street Presbyterian in uh, Virginia. And so you can see this is, uh, again, Greek Revival style. See that? And so, sorry, what? That's right. It, it, so it looks a lot like, which of course you can understand originally the church shied away from designing their churches, buildings like that because it had all sorts of connotations of being a pagan temple. Well, in the 19th and 18th and 19th centuries, there was enough sufficient distance removed from paganism. They had no problem appropriating that. And it was, again, uh, it wasn't excessively ornate. It's simple, right? You have columns. It's, it's fairly restrained. It's, again, to convey that kind of modesty, and that kind of elegant simplicity. Now, this was, uh, going back to what we've previously discussed, R.L. Dabney. Dabney actually makes the argument. Um, yes, sorry. There was, on this particular church, there is not. Um, 
of course, you would have very often, you would have Greek revival styles that would still have steeples. Um, so that's not out of the question. Was there another question? Someone, okay. So uh, Arl Dabney, when he discusses this, he, whatever you think, and I, I still haven't worked out my own views of, of, of the philosophy of art, but um, he argued that something like this, if not exactly like that, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly like that, but something that follows the same architectural and design principles of something like that is what Protestants want because, again, he harped on elegant simplicity. You want elegant simplicity. You want something that reflects order, beauty, restraint, uh, without seeming to be superstitious and without seeming to be saying, well, we need to engage all the senses in order to uh, lift up the worshiper. Are there any questions on that? Any questions on? Yes. When did, uh, in the 14th century, was it, I mean, part of the uh, which is sort of taking into the model? Mm -hmm. When did they start that central altar and furniture is going to fall into the altar? That's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of an exact date but I do believe it was fairly early. Um, of course, again, this is several centuries removed from the apostolic church. And so I wouldn't draw a line from saying, well, you have them calling it an altar in the fourth century. Therefore, this is what they were doing. You know, this is somehow continuity with the apostles. But I do believe it was relatively early. Yes. Yeah. Pictures you showed it did not have yet. Yeah. It didn't have it, but a lot of churches do. Right. Um, my only guess, and this is just a guess, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on architecture, but my guess would be just as, a, as an indication to a surrounding community that this is signaling this is where your church is, right? Yes? Wasn't there an idea of like the right. heavenward? That's right, and you see that even with the medieval churches, and you'll see it not... Right, so it's vertical, it's heaven-oriented, so you don't only see the steeple, you see even internally, if you look at the, uh, those vaulted arches, and you go in, and I showed you that image, you look at those vaulted arches, and it is designed to not only, we've talked about drawing the eye forward toward the altar, but it's also drawing the eye upward toward heaven, right? That it's very, uh, sometimes you would even have, um, the aisles were typically lower, than the ceiling, than the nave ceiling, but sometimes they would actually put them at the same height, and they are just unbelievably tall, right? They're they're stretching to the heavens, um, which again is 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 good as far as it goes. Uh, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that, uh, and it is it is admirable that they wanted to have their eyes drawn to heaven. Uh, the danger again becomes you, you don't want to associate this with some sort of Tower of Babel, right? We're building, we're building our buildings to heaven. We're going to reach our way up to God rather than Him condescending to us in His Word. Yes. I will say, having been to into some of the churches in Poland, Lithuania, and Germany in that area, it is very awe inspiring when you go into a church mm. with that box ceiling, and it, it just almost sure. it's amazing when you. Sure. Uh, I'm awestruck when I stop thinking sure. about the colors and the beauty of that church. Right, yeah, and it's designed for that purpose. I think um, one of the issues is you get the same sense, don't you, uh, when you look at mountains, right? The same sense of transcendence. You get the same sense when you look at the heavens, right? Uh, so I think that it's perfectly reasonable for architecture to reflect that. Uh, but at the same time, that is a function of, of natural theology, not supernatural theology. That's a function of, let me put it another way. If you're going to build beautiful buildings, those beautiful buildings ought to be everywhere, not just in churches. So why can't a government building look like that? It doesn't say anything or shouldn't say anything specifically about the nature of that building or the grace that you will find there because it can't be attached to that place. But just as a function of natural beauty, well, sure, you can find natural beauty in all sorts of places. But however, uh, going all the way back to sacrifice, yep. you didn't bring a blemish to land. 
you didn't bring a sick or a hurt child, oxen, or anything as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You brought the best. So the, the concept of presenting our best to God would be go all the way through everything we do in our daily worship. Uh, that's true. So we want to do, the, the question isn't, yeah, so the question isn't whether we want to do our best. That's true. We absolutely want to do our best. And the question is, what does the best mean? And that, since we don't have specific instructions in the Word of God, again, regarding architecture, the way we ought to build our buildings, <clears throat> the best we can do is follow sound reason and Christian prudence. And that would suggest that yes, it ought not to be ugly. We ought to, if we're going to build something, let's make it beautiful. But at the same time, let's do so in a way that reflects that elegant simplicity of Protestant theology, that reflects the modesty and restraint of Protestant theology, and not say, again, something like broke art and architecture that is specifically designed to draw the senses away from the spiritual. Yes? Um, so obviously, uh, we have to have a place to work. That's right whether it's outdoors or under in a structure or whatever, um, or if, you know, it was uh, in the catacombs or wherever, sure. you know. Um, but uh, we no longer have an earthly temple. Sure. Um, and so the building that we're meeting in no longer is somehow designed to, this is just reaffirming. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Designed to convey anything spiritual in and of itself. Sure. Um, and that's why the simplicity that you're talking about, right? That's right. So the steeples, um, when we were in Charleston, uh, I was told that um, the tallest building in Charleston is not, by law, is not allowed to exceed sure. the highest church steeple. Sure, sure. Um, to see it over so yep. that they would be able right. to see the churches that's right. yeah. um, in the town. And I think that's appropriate um, yep. because then you're talking about being able to distinguish between a building that's right. not a church, that I think is useful sure. for the purpose of people being able to recognize, oh, this is a church, yeah. um, but not some sort of a spiritual. That's right. Thing. That's right. I think that's exactly right. So that's a, you again, that light of nature and Christian prudence says the church is central to civic and social life. And so when you have a design, you could do something like that. And it's obviously, tr it's obvious to everyone. That's the church. It plays a central feature in our corporate or communal life wonderful but at the same time you're right it doesn't actually say this particular building is going to convey grace to you right um and so i think may, trying to maintain that distinction maintain that balance is appropriate uh and, and i do think there's something to the belief that uh you know consistently taught protestant theology will lead us in the direction of art being uh elegant and simple uh, rather than excessively ornate um, because it's a reflection of the the restraint and modesty found within natural law itself. Um, any questions or comments on that? Yes. Um, going back to what you were talking about with the square table, it reminds me of the church that we went to in England, our two church. Mm. There was a uh, really long stage, mm. and you could see the corners of the meetings yeah. there. And they had built an extension that went over the railing, came all the way around, and they would set up chairs on both sides of that. Oh, wow. Right. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so some people still try to maintain that, uh, that it is a table, that it is a meal. Um, the, in, in the Reformation, there were at least some churches, and this is interesting to me because I don't know, I can't remember the size of this particular congregation, so I don't know practically how this would work out, but they had the instructions in their, in their book and in, in what was effectively their directory for worship. They had a portable table. And so they would literally set up for the supper. They would bring in that portable table for celebrating the supper. Um, I can't imagine that it was that large. To, you know, how many people could you actually sit at this one portable table? I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so even when, even when we're celebrating it, I think it should, uh, we want to make sure that we understand it and, and we reaffirm this, uh, that it is a meal that we're sharing together. It is uh, a supper. And granted, it's not one table, but you all are sitting together at this meal and sharing it. Now, uh, Next, we're going to briefly talk about uh, vestments 
uh, what was called the vestments or the Vestarian controversy. Uh, you all know what vestments are. Uh, these are uh, sometimes they're uh, referred to the, as the Westamenta Sacra, the sacred vestments, the sacred clothes. And they are clothing, it's clothing that is distinctly set apart as religious and is worn by a priestly class. Uh, so you find this, for example, in the Anglican Church, you find it in the Roman Catholic Church, you find it in the Lutheran Church. Uh, you can think of items, and I won't go into detail, and, and they have different meanings and different significance, but you have the surplus, and you have the alb, and you have the cassock, and you have the chasuble, and so on. And there are all these different garments that priests will wear that are seen as religious. Now, going back to our regulative principle of worship, we do not have specific instructions, either express, expressly or by good and necessary consequence, in the Word of God, telling us that the priest ought to wear a certain kind of clothing in the New Testament period. Now, in Exodus chapter, I believe it's 28, you do have specific instructions for the Old Testament priesthood saying they need to wear this kind of clothing. And it specifically says that it's for beauty and for glory, and it is set, set apart as sacred. So you have sacred clothing for the priesthood. But remember, this is associated with tabernacle worship and later with temple worship. We've already discussed with the coming of the New Testament, all of that has passed away. So you don't have, not only is it that we don't have priestly garments anymore, uh, we don't have a distinct priest class anymore. It was a type and a shadow. So all believers are priests, right? And we have one high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we don't have a, a, a distinct priestly class and therefore we don't have distinct priestly garments anymore. This was an issue of contention within the Anglican Church in the 16th century, giving rise to what was called the vestments for the Vestarian controversy. A man by the name of John Hooper uh, was a member of the Church of England, and he rejected vestments. He did not want to wear them. He thought that this was uh, an impediment. It was connected, of course, again, to Roman Catholic worship. Uh, and he had learned from his time on the European continent that other Reformed churches did not have vestments. Even where they had gowns, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, even where they had gowns, they did not have vestments. They did not have a distinctly religious garb. Now, this, of course, became a, a problem. There were debates about this in the 1550s and into the 1560s. There were ministers who refused to wear the vestments. They would not sign on to this in the Anglican Church, and so they lost their jobs. Uh, they were fired, and they were given a, a period, a, a grace period, where they were allowed to change their mind, uh, but if they didn't, then you were out and you were not going to receive a salary as a minister anymore. This is also the time, because of this controversy, that you see the growth of English Presbyterianism. English Presbyterians rejected this again on the basis of the regulative principle. So the debate basically went like this. One side is saying, you can't command this. This is not something that, it's a, it's a thing indifferent, what they called adiaphora. It's a thing indifferent. And so we don't need to bind people's consciences and say to be a priest, you need to wear this kind of clothing. The other side said, we grant that. So there were many Anglicans who said, sure, we believe it is a thing indifferent. We don't believe it's commanded by God, but we believe for the sake of the unity and order of the church that the government, the, the crown and the church itself can impose this on its priests. We can make you do this. And you can think about how this comes up later with the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, in the 17th century, it's going to be the same kind of argument that's being made with the Book of Common Prayer. So there are going to be people saying, again, lots of stuff is good in the Book of Common Prayer, but you can't bind our consciences by saying we have to use this each Sunday. And then you're going to have the state, uh, the state church come back and say, well, we can make you do that for the sake of the unity of the church, even though it's not commanded by God. And so this already is occurring in the 1550s and 1560s with the, the vestments issue. And so you have this debate about, well, can the church, can the state tell people, even when it's not commanded by God, that you have to do something, you have to do it this way, and that you're required to wear these particular religious garments. There was a moderating position as well. So there were some people who advised, uh, even from the continent, when they were asked, they advised some of the Anglican uh, ministers. They said, well, how about you do this? You have to wear the garments in order to keep your job, in order to be a minister. Okay? But you believe that it's wrong. 
you believe that it's wrong for the church to impose it. It's not wrong to wear it, but it's wrong for the church to impose it. And so they advised some of these ministers to wear the garments, but preach against them, right? Okay. And so it's, it's, it's a, sometimes out of practical necessity, it was what they had to do. Um, and so some saw that as a fitting strategy that, well, we don't believe the church has the authority to impose this. We don't believe it's intrinsically sinful to wear them. But we don't believe the church has the authority to bind our consciences with us and to oppose it. So even as we wear them, we will preach against them. Um, others obviously uh, disagreed with this and said strategically, uh, out of uh, conscience, uh, we're just not going to do that. And so they lost their jobs. Uh, you see this continue all the way through Puritanism. This is actually partly where the description of Puritan comes from. The Puritan faction re rejected vestments. They said, we do not have religious clothing. We are not commanded in the word of God to wear a certain type of religious clothing. You cannot bind our consciences that way, so we're not going to do it. Um, now, the question then becomes, okay, so we don't have in our church, because of the regular principle and because of the spirituality of the church, we don't have a distinct priestly class and we don't have religious garments for our ministers. So why do Eric and I often wear the Geneva gown? Any guesses? It's certainly helpful. It's certainly helpful for that purpose. <laughs> Hopefully not that distracting otherwise. Uh, it's not like I'm coming here with like a, a bright orange tie with blue polka dots or something. Um, so, you know, the, the real reason that we do this actually carries over from the Continental Reformation, uh, hence the word Geneva gown, right? In the Continental Reformation, you can see this in various uh, Reformed cities. For example, in Zurich, in their Book of Church Order, they specifically give guidance on what kind of clothing is a minister supposed to wear. They didn't have vestments, so they specifically tell uh, their ministers in, in Zurich in the 16th century, you are to wear clothing that is something like orderly, decent clothing that reflects a professional class. You are to wear the same clothing that the professional class would wear, like doctors and lawyers and statesmen and so on. Well... What that ended up doing was the professional class typically wore black robes. And to this day, who else wears those kinds of black robes? Academics. If you go to a university setting and you have special university functions, they will wear gowns. They will wear academic gowns. Uh, even sometimes, and this is, not, this is not as frequent today, it still happens, but when I was at Oxford, there was... One, the one group of professors was permitted, only one faculty was permitted to wear their academic gowns if they lectured uh, at the exam schools. The one group of people that was allowed to do this was the divinity faculty, theology professors, because it was considered the queen of the sciences. But in any case, historically, outside of the exam schools, professors can wear their academic gowns to lecture, and some of them did. Uh, so the idea is that the gowns that we wear are not they don't have a religious significance. They're not saying we're a priestly class. They're, it's not saying we're set apart as spiritually distinct from you. It's designed to convey that the ministerial office is in fact a professional and is supposed to be an educated office. Right? Uh, it's supposed to be the same kind of thing that you would see if you had an academic lecturer wearing an academic gown when he's lecturing or at an at a academic event. Um, is that, yes? Um, the whole thing had, you know, Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep. Spencer Clifford? Yeah. yeah. Why does he wear the white robe instead of the red one? If I'm not mistaken, and Phil may be able to correct me, uh, he was originally from an Anglican background, was he not? Yeah. 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 yeah, he was ordained in the Anglican Church. So he's 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 uh he's at heart, he's an Anglican. Yeah. Uh, although to be fair, because of the uh, the nature of American religion and the the intersection of Anglican and Presbyterian uh, families and relationships uh, here, you will often find influences from Anglicanism, and this is partly why we're even doing this class, that spill over into the Presbyterian Church. So there are Presbyterians who, uh, they're, they're at least Presbyterian in name, and they would not have a problem with vestments. But 
that would just be out of accord in principle with Presbyterian belief and practice for, for several centuries. Uh, but it is just a weird kind of sort of a mishmash where you're getting a little bit of Presbyterianism, a little bit of Anglicanism, and so on. Um, any other questions, comments? Yes. That's right. So judges are a professional class, and so you have uh, judges wear robes. It's not saying that judges have a special religious significance. It's not saying that judges are religiously superior to anybody else. They're not. Uh, and so that's what we want to guard against is suggesting, as vestments do, uh, that there is a special priestly class that is the sort of your way to God, right? Your mediators through whom you uh, must go to reach God. That's not what Eric and I are. We're not priests. We are ministers of word and sacrament, and that's it. We are not a connecting point between you and God. Your connection to God is direct and mediated only through Christ. You mentioned that this is not uh, priesthood but from believers, all of us. Yes. Is there any specific where appearance that... Yes. Ordinary that's right. That's an excellent question. Um, so, yes. So going back to what we talked about be before, we need to dress in a way that is accord with the light of nature and Christian prudence. And the light of nature and Christian prudence would indicate that when we gather for worship, we're doing something that is solemn. We're doing something that is, in fact, sacred. But we're doing something that is worthy of respect. It's dignified. And so dress all to accord with the, that, that uh, setup. So... Uh, dress accordingly. Uh, we don't believe that you can just come in in your PJs and it doesn't really matter <laughs> uh, because God doesn't care. Well, yes, God cares about the heart, but that heart is going to be reflected in external life. It's going to be reflected in the way you dress. It's going to be reflected in the way you carry yourself and so on. And so we want to say to the best of your ability, uh, when you come to church, you're dressing in a way that's dignified uh, in a way that is respectful in a way that recognizes the solemnity of what we're doing. Yes? Can of worms. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Isn't that all relative? I mean, Jesus' day, they were wearing robes. This is the way I've always seen that discussion. Sure. Um, so today, yes, pajamas, if someone wears pajamas, yeah. it means, oh, look, they'd be wearing the bedroom. But, in fact, what people have worn throughout centuries and millennia um, has varied greatly. At one point, you know, people only had, in this society, it would only have, like, their everyday clothing, and then maybe Sunday best, yep. if, they, if they could. That's right. Um, or, yeah, so there, there's a separate issue there of what is possible. Um, so we certainly want to say not, not everybody in every culture and every time is going to be able to have a nicer pair of clothes, right? Anything that, what they would otherwise wear, right? So... It is not placing a burden on the believer to say, well, you have to go out and spend your last dime on this kind of clothing. That's not the idea. Uh, but at the same time, there are basic principles of, again, beauty, order, elegance, and simplicity that are universally applicable. And so while some, there might be some cultural modifications right, from one place to another, from one time to another, that's fine. Some of the principles are going to be the same. And in fact, uh, there's a discussion of this in, uh, in the 16th century, you'll see Protestants will write commentaries on some pagan ethical works, largely approvingly, uh, and that included uh, Cicero's De Afficis. And Cicero will talk about, in his De Afficis, his own duties, he will talk about clothing and decorum. And even as there are cultural changes, the belief was there are certain basic principles that, again, are stable across space and across time so that wherever you would go, you would say, for example, people talk about the modesty issues related, and people say, well, modesty is relative. Uh, not really. Uh, th there are some variations, again, uh, that we can, we can see, but uh, there are some basic principles as well. And to violate those ba basic principles uh, is to be immodest or to be obscene, and that's true here just as much, much as it was true a century ago, just as much as it was true five centuries ago. So modesty, the principles of modesty haven't changed, even when the particular application might look different. The principles of dignity uh, and respect in clothing haven't changed, even where the particular application might look different. Um, so, yes? <clears throat> One thing I, I guess, kind of 
triggered something uh, in my mind was uh, the lady, lady behind me said. But, uh, <clears throat> um, the emphasis on the simplicity and, and the truth that makes, I think, makes the most sense probably in any culture. But again, the, the relative aspect that he was mentioning. Um, I have attended a church in Southern Virginia um, where they recently had a uh, complete reconstruction of their building and it's, it's actually looked really nice. I've shown it to people sort of from overseas and everyone thinks it's amazing. It's very simple mm. and it's elegant. Yeah. It, for the most part, I think, um, fulfills the criteria that we're talking about. Sure, sure, sure. But in that culture, uh, Japanese Christians who know the way the temples are built, they can draw symbolic uh, connections between the two. Uh, the mention of, and this is what I'll say, the, the mention of the, the, the Greek you know, temple yeah. aspect. Um, I would think that those principles of those concerns would, and what, if people are able to draw parallels, would basically become a stumbling block. Sure, sure. Should far outweigh any of the simplicity and elegance and trying to find absolute um, uh, not absolute beauty, but the principles that you're talking about. Sure, sure. Um, I'm not saying that you didn't address that before. I just yeah. something that kind of bothers me. Yeah, no, I think that uh, if I'm understanding correctly, so yes, you don't want something like that to be a stumbling block, um, but there are other ways around that without violating the principles because the principles have different cultural expressions anyway. So uh, what's going to be, so elegant simplicity in Japan is going to have a particular expression. Elegant simplicity in Western Europe is going to have a particular expression. Uh, elegant simplicity in North America is going to have a particular expression. And so since the, you have different expressions of those particular principles, uh, it becomes possible then to at least envision even uh, to get away from those associations, even buildings we have not yet designed yet that still follow those principles but are sufficiently distinct to set them apart from anything like paganism. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yep. Just, that's one aspect that you can't get away from. Sure, you sure. Yeah, you, you're never going to be able to wait to get get rid of particular application and, and having to apply it in particular ways. Um, that puts us at time. Any any last minute questions or comments? All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you again for blessing us with your word and with your spirit for granting us a supernatural salvation. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we have a place to worship, that you have given us a place together where we can uh, fellowship with one another and enjoy all the benefits that you have given us in Christ. Uh, we ask, Lord, that we would uh, treat those benefits with the dignity and, sol and the solemnity that they deserve, uh, that we would be blessed by them, that we would enjoy you today. In Christ's name I pray, amen.